Okay, hello everyone. I'm calling the, this committee, Environment, Climate, and Legacy to order. Let the record show that right now is 310 on Tuesday, March 5th, 2024. We have a number of bills today. Uh, we have uh, Senate File 4116, Minnesota Res Resiliency Community Act, uh, Senate File 3907, Senate House Child's Bill, uh, on the, the lands bill, and then also I have a bill too later, uh, Senate File 3905. Sen Senate, uh, Senator Mitchell will be here to present her bill, Senate File 4168, uh, Waste Composition Study Requirement, and Senator Kupak's bill, Senate File 3940, uh, the e-waste bill. So we have... Um, a list of testifiers as well. Uh, we'll get some timing later when we come to Senator Kupak's bill. And so uh, the first on our agenda is Senator McCune's bill, Senate File 4116, Minnesota Res Resilient Community Act. And so I'd like to welcome Senator McCune to the table. And Senator McCune, any time when you're ready. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members. Um, it's my pleasure today to bring forward Senate File 4116, the Minnesota Resilient Community Act, um, which really does um, uh, codify state government's role in supporting communities as they prepare for the impacts of climate change. As we know, uh, climate change has effects on all Minnesota communities from extreme storms to unhealthy air, as we saw with the forest fires um, for a number of summers now, um, uh, or even just being unable to go ice fishing in many parts of our state this year at different times. Uh, communities are asking the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for assistance to adapt, and the need for this assistance continues to grow. The legislature recognized, as we all know, this need by appropriating $100 million in grants to communities, and that is still a fraction, unfortunately, of what is going to be needed in the future. Um, while the MPCA provides support and assistance already, formalizing this work into statute will help ensure communities continue to receive this technical and financial assistance and that the agencies work in this area can meet the needs of the future. And with that, um, Mr. Chair and members, I'll turn it over to um, our expert who can talk about the bill as well. Okay, welcome and introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Frank Kolash. I use him pronouns, and I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Air and Climate Policy with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And I'm here to speak about Senate File 4116 and thank Senator McEwen for authoring the bill. The bill contains the MPCA's proposed policy change that will directly support Minnesota's climate action framework by codifying the MPCA's commitment to help Minnesota communities prepare for and adapt to our changing climate. The proposed policy change would build on the already funded Resilient Communities Grant programs and provide stronger authority for the MPCA to ensure local governments and tribal governments have the assistance and support to continue their preparations for a changing climate now and in the future. To date, the MPCA has awarded approximately $490,000 in planning grants to communities with populations of less than 10,000 and approximately $1.4 million in planning grants to communities of all sizes. The MPCA also has a $35 million grant open through April 11th to help local communities and tribal governments to build stormwater projects that will prepare their communities for Minnesota's changing climate. We modeled the proposed language on MPCA's existing authorities to assist with pollution prevention activities and environmental assistance grants. We have heard on multiple occasions from local governments and tribal governments that they need assistance to ensure they can provide the critical services to their residences. The proposed language ensures that the MPCA will continue to support communities and work with other state agencies, universities, and nonprofits, and the federal government to ensure Minnesotans have access to the information, technical assistance, financial assistance, training, and tools to support their work. We are all experiencing the impacts of changing climate in both Minnesota and other parts of the continent. 
Minnesota has become warmer and wetter, and we have seen more high-intensity precipitation events, and we expect these trends to continue. We have all experienced the unhealthy air quality from smoke coming from wildfires in Canada and parts of the West Coast. The proposed policy change would require no new FTEs at the Pollution Control Agency, and we'll make clear we have the authority to assist communities in building resilience and adapting to a rapidly changing climate. The contents of the bill are as follows, with Subdivision 3, establishing the program within the MPCA and define, identifying the purposes and principles of the program, including a focus on environmental justice communities and low-income and disadvantaged communities. Sub Subdivision 4 identifies the specific types of assistance that we may develop and provide to local governments and tribal governments. And the potential types of services allowed include assembling and providing information on climate adaptation and resilience, providing technical assistance, providing grants or loans for planning and implementation of projects, providing assistance on how we can all measure progress to build climate resiliency and adaptation. Subdivision 5 provides mechanisms for the MPCA to partner with others in order to provide the support and work of the Resilient Communities Assistance Program. And Subdivision 6 provides the authority for the governor or the commissioner to issue commendations of excellence to recognize the efforts of local governments and tribal governments in adapting to and preparing for a changing climate. I thank you for the opportunity to, test, to testify on Senate File 4116 today. This bill will strengthen our commitment to meet the vision and goals of Minnesota's Climate Action Framework and ensure local governments and tribal governments have the support they need to prepare for a warmer and wetter Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner Kolesh. Um, any question from members? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This could probably be for your testifier, Senator uh, McEwen. Um, is there anything in this uh, bill that you're not currently doing? Assistant Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we are, we, there are items within this that we are, are not currently do, doing. Uh, this does allow us to have then the, make sure we have the authority. We do have staff that have been assigned uh, to do some of this work. This backs us up and provides that additional authority to move forward and ensure that we have uh, the ability and then local communities and tribal governments can count on us to continue to work and provide that assistance to them. Senator Mr. Green. Chair, and uh, to the testifier then, um, as I understand it, both the University of Minnesota and the MPCA currently provide these services. And if you're adding services to them and you're going to put it in statute, then I would assume you're going to be coming back here year after year with an increased budget for the MPCA. Do you have any kind of fiscal note on this? Assistant Commissioner. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, we have received the uh, fiscal note request. We are filling that out at this time. Uh, it will represent that it will not require any new FTEs for this bill. Senator Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So that, uh, that means you're not going to be asking for any more money, I guess. We'll see. Uh, there's some open-ended uh, language in here <clears throat> uh, on line uh, 2.6. Other political organizations. You've listed some organizations. What are the other political organizations? Or are you just leaving it open to anything that comes along? Assistant Commissioner Kola. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Senator Green, that language is there to make sure that we do not inadvertently leave out a uh, an entity of local government or tribal governments that could use the support. Uh, we have seen instances where certain entities have been left out on the definitions and, and then they're not able to get the, the same level of support and assistance. And so we wanted to make sure that that language was uh, expansive, but it is restricted to the, the definitions of local governments and tribal governments that are in, in the bill. Senator Green. Uh, Mr. Chair, then I, I guess I, I'm not really following you on that because I, I don't know if there's going to be any kind of new government that springs up uh, unless you plan on creating a new kind of government somewhere along the line. But also in 2.27, it says other efforts needed to support the climate. Now, this is giving the commissioner, once again, I don't even know if it's possible to give him more power than we already have, but uh, other efforts, is it seems to me to be just so broad uh, 
it, it looks like that in this legislation, we're actually giving the commissioner the authority to write as write their own laws, and just make them up as they go. Uh, any other groups, other efforts, uh, uh, public and private entities that operate programs. That's another one on line 3.1. Uh, who are we talking about here on the on the public and private entities? Are these uh, nonprofits? Are they for profit? Uh, what other entities are you, do you mean there? Assistant Commissioner. Yeah, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Green, the other opportunities, those, the, uh, the other entities were focused on, again, making sure that we can provide the assistance and we can engage with uh, universities, nonprofits. There may be some uh, for-profit entities, uh, particularly as we address with climate change, we're looking at uh, opportunities to, to work with architects as they start to, and, and other engineers, about how they can help local communities and tribal governments be in the design phase and the building of resilient projects and moving forward to make sure that the services that local governments and tribal governments provide to their residents are prepared for a changing climate. So we wanted to be inclusive about who we can work with and not end up having a, a partner out there that could provide excellent service or assist us in providing the excellent service to local governments without having um, that excluded just by the language. Any other, any further discussion? Um, back to you, Senator McCune, any closing comment? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, to um, say thank you for hearing this bill, Chair and, and members. And I want to thank Assistant Commissioner um, for coming here today and taking some questions that appeared to be asked with some derision, which um, are, seem disrespectful to me. But I, um, I, I ask for your support. We clearly know the need is there. We've allocated the funds. This is a program that is, essentially, that is already happening. This is really just codifying it to make sure that it, it endures. So I ask for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McEwen. And we'll lay over Senate file 4116 for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. And let the record show that we uh, have quorum right at the beginning, but I forgot to mention it. Uh, next, on our agenda is Senate File 3907, uh, the DNR Land Bill, Senator House Chow. Welcome to the table, Senator House Chow. Thank um, you, Mr. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, I uh, informed that you had two author, uh, authors' amendment. So you may present, uh, Senator House Chow. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, before I begin on Senate File 3907, I do have t uh, two amendments, um, essentially just some uh, private land sales for Aiken and St. Louis County, the A1 and the A2 amendment. Okay, any uh, expl explanation on the amendment or just? They are just um, some land sales that were not included in the original bill, technical and non-controversial for St. Louis County and Aiken County, Mr. Chair. Okay, so members and House shall move that uh, the A1 amendment to Senate file 3907 be adopted. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? A motion prevail. Now, to also to Senator House um, amendment, uh, he moved that uh, the A2 amendment to Senate File 3907 be adopted. And all in favor say aye. Chair, yes. I don't have the A2 Is it coming? Uh, Mr. Uh, Senator Green has been passed out at the moment. And it's been posted online as well. We're good. So um, here's the motion. Uh, we, uh, Senator House House moves that the A2 amendment to Senate File 3907 be adopted. All in favor, 
say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion prevail. Now to the bill as amended, Senate House shall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, each year, the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources proposes a lands bill that includes amendments to statutes that govern DNR's lands transactions, changes to statutory boundaries of state parks, state recreation areas, or state forests, and legislative authorization for select land sales. State parks and forest lands are established by legislation, so the legislator must authorize changes to those borders. Land sales require legislative approval in some circumstances where lands will be sold by private citizens sale, where certain lands border public waters, or where land is to be sold for less than market value. The 2024 Lands Bill proposes amendments to several statutes, provides for changes to certain state park boundaries and grants the DNR authority to sell certain uh, lands that require legislative approval. The bill authorizes the DNR to sell some lands by private sale and for less than market value. The DNR has determined that the lands proposed for sale either no longer meet conservation or recreation needs, or that the sales are needed to resolve land management issues. The DNR works in coordination with the counties and Minnesota tribal nations to ensure land sales are included in the bill when applicable and that all provisions have been thoroughly reviewed before being heard. This bill represents a technical need for the agency and to ensure they can meet their business needs and work in partnership with counties and tribal nations to address their land sale and conveyance issues. Um, and with that, I will pass it to the DNR for uh, a review of the proposed legislation. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you and welcome and please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. Good afternoon. My name is Lori Klein. I'm an attorney with the DNR Division of Lands and Minerals. I'll walk you through the 2024 Lands Bill today. Section one of the Lands Bill seeks to amend Minnesota Statute 85015 subdivision one. That section requires a landowner that has a pre-existing right of access over a trail right of way to pay a $2,000 application <coughs> fee when requesting an easement from the DNR. The proposed change would allow the DNR to assume that application fee when DNR's land management interests would benefit from issuance of the easement. Sections two and three relate to costs incurred by the DNR in connection with land exchanges. Um, section two amends Minnesota Statute 94343, subdivision 8A, which applies to exchanges of class A land. Currently, that subdivision grants DNR authority to charge fees of not less than one half of the cost for determining the value and for survey costs. This proposal adds additional types of fees to that list, including for legal and professional fees, title work, advertising, for public hearings, transactional staff costs, and closing costs. Section three, um, also relating to exchanges, amends Minnesota Statute 94-3495, which governs expedited exchanges. Those are exchanges between the state and governmental subdivisions of the state. The sta this statute does not currently authorize the DNR to charge those fees to the exchange partner, and this proposal will change that to add that authority. And the types of fees that we will be able to recover are the same types that we are seeking in in section two. The bill also proposes additions to three state park boundaries. Um, section four subdivision one adds approximately 40 acres to Banning State Park in Pine County, and that is a parcel already owned by the state. Section four subdivision two adds approximately 120 acres to Father Hennepin State Park um, to facilitate a possible future acquisition of that land. In Section 4, Subdivision 3, that adds approximately 20 acres to Lake Louise State Park, also to facilitate a possible future acquisition of the land. Section 5 and 11 of this bill um, also achieves technical consistency um, with the transfer of the Upper Sioux Agency State Park, um, consistent with 2023 legislation directing the transfer. It does this by abolishing the park and removing the park from the list of statutory state parks in Minnesota Statute 85012. In addition, the bill abolishes and removes the Hill Annex Mine State Park from this same list to allow for active iron ore mining at the site. Section 6 through 10 of the bill authorize the commissioner to sell certain lands. Um, we do have, the DNR already has authority to sell some lands and we do conduct some land sales, but these particular sales require legislative authorization 
uh, because they are either sold by private sale rather than auction or they border public waters or are sold for less than market value or some combination of those. I do have short explanations about each parcel. If you would like me to provide that, please let me know. But section 6 authorizes the public sale of about 12 acres of riparian land in Chisago County together with a channel construction maintenance easement and an access easement. I do want to note that the maps that we provided in advance of this hearing um, depicts this parcel, but it inadvertently omitted the channel easement from the map. It would be um, sort of a strip coming out of the east side, and we can provide an updated map if desired. Section 7 and 8 authorize a conveyance of about 2.9 acres of land in Hubbard County. Section 9 authorizes the conveyance of approximately 20 acres in Redwood County to a federally recognized Indian tribe for no consideration. Section 10 authorizes the private sale of approximately 15.1 acres of land in Roseau County to a watershed district. And that concludes my comments. Thank you for your time today. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Klein. Any questions, Senator Green? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, um, generally, I like the lands bills. There is a couple of questions I have here. Um, the first one is not really a question, but kind of. On uh, 325, you talk about the Hill Annex Mine and you're abolishing it. And if I remember right from years ago, back when uh, uh, Landwehr was a commissioner, I think he made the statement that this, land, this uh, park lost so much money that it would be better to give everybody that came there 20 bucks and send them somewhere else. So it might be long past time to abolish it, but what happens to it? Ms. Klein. Um, Mr. Chair, I would like to defer to um, either Joe Henderson or Ann Pierce with the Department of Natural Resources on that question. Okay. Please come up and uh, introduce yourself for the record. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. My name is Joe Henderson. I'm in the division director, uh, Minnesota DNR Lands and Minerals Division. So it was anticipated when the Hill Annex State Park um, was designated as a state park that mining would be an acceptable, um, you know, operation, and and that in fact it was anticipated that it could return to mining if a project were to come forward. We actually have two projects right now that have come forward and are seeking to lease in-ground minerals and surface minerals that are currently within the boundary of the state park. So the goal here would be, and it's, it's the preferred use of the property as far as the local community is considered, and it was anticipated from, from the beginning, uh, to turn this area back into a park, uh, or excuse me, back into a mine. And at the end of the life of mine, we would propose to get back with the stakeholders in the community. This is section 16, so this is uh, school trust land. Um, and so the benefits will go to the school trust here. But to look with the community at the end of the life of the mine there to decide what the best use would be again, um, it may look very different 20 or 30 years from now. Okay. Senator Green. Thank you. And then, Mr. Chair, the next question would be on page 8, starting at 1-5. It just says you're going to uh, sell the land to a watershed district, and obviously that would be Roseau Watershed District, because Roseau County. Uh, but it doesn't really say if there's a use for it. And one of the issues that I've had with some of the watershed districts is that uh, pieces of land will come and they'll just buy them and sit on them. And uh, and the, a lot of times, uh, it uh, that land would be much better served if it was put back in private ownership. And so I'm, I'm assuming there'd be nobody here from Rosa Watershed District, but do you know if there's a specific purpose for this land that they're, at, that they're getting, or is it just they're going to have it on, uh, on reserve? <clears throat> Ms. Klein and Mr. Anderson. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, um, my, to my understanding, and I'm happy to provide additional information um, after this hearing, but my understanding is that this parcel lays within an area of a rehabilitation project called the Roseau Lake Rehabilitation Project, and that as a result of those um, that work over there, that a levee has been constructed, and the levee sort of blocks off that triangular parcel from the state land. 
and the watershed district is willing to take that. But as part of this much larger project, my general understanding is that it is possible that the watershed may be talking to the adjacent landowner, and you know, it is possible that it could be conveyed to them, but I don't have details, but I could certainly look more into that. Okay, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. On that, on that subject, and just to make people aware, I don't think there was a lot of buy-in on that uh, levy that was put up, and I think it's going to flood back a lot of people up there, and there was a lot of consternation, and so uh, I don't know how, uh, how close they got to resolving that, but is, is that, uh, is, has there been any discomfort with this language from the local people, do you know? Ms. Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Green. I'm not aware of any recent. Okay, any I recent can I can check that. that out. And then the last question that I have, Mr. Chair, and that Senator this Green. is not really my question because it's not in my district, uh, but I was asked uh, on the on the Upper Sioux State Park uh, on line 325 uh, when this went through last year. I believe there was. Uh, um, well, there was a lot of uh, issues with it that people thought it was moved through fast, but in that bill, it, was, it would require the state to buy land somewhere else, which I had a problem with. But the question is, are they working on that for, to replace that? Ms. Klein. Mr. Chair, Senator Green, um, I would like to defer that question to Ann Pierce, Director of Parks and Trails, and also just clarify my previous comment that I'm not aware of any comments about the flooding, but it is also something I can look into if you would like more information. Yeah, please. I don't have much information on that. Thank you. And welcome, Ms. Pierce. Uh, please introduce your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm Ann Pierce, and I am the Parks and Trails Director for the Department of Natural Resources. Um, Senator Green, so the, um, the land had what is called land and water conservation funds on it, and those, that's a status, and that status had to be removed and placed in another location, and that process of placing it is still in the process of happening. The other piece of that was that there was uh, funds appropriated for the process of the transfer. And um, within that, we were working with the local community to look at recreational opportunities in that area. Um, we worked throughout the summer on that process. There were a number of ideas that came forward, and we're still in the process of working with the local units of government and the community to, um, to place that money on some of those recreational opportunities. So we had a, a lot of engagement in that, a lot of good ideas, and so now we're trying to finalize what that might look like. All right, any further questions um, on the land bill? Um, if not, uh, we'll motion the, the uh, Senate file uh, 3907 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. All right, so there we go. Thank you. Next is my bill. And I'd like to pass the gavel to Vice Chair Senator McEwen. And I will. Your bill, Senator Her. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, Senate File 3907 uh, provides the frameworks for DNR to have successful implementation of new electronic license system, or ELS, 
which will include a mobile phone application in March of 2025. The ELS is a primary system that issue, issue angling, hunting license, and permits to residents of Minnesota and visitors. The ELS also register and title outdoor recreation vehicles, including watercraft and off-highway vehicles. The new modern system will make it easier for customers to buy licenses, register their harvest, and sign up for safety training. It will also improve the business process for agents, registrar, and DNR staff. This legislation makes the statutory changes needed to allow people to enjoy the advantages of the modern license system. It does not modify the underlying intent of our existing law. In summary, this bill provides the changes needed to move from current licensing system to the new system once it's ready for implementation and only include necessary pieces to make sure that that transition is SIMS-led. I have here to testify with me is uh, Colonel Raman Smith. Thank you very much, Chair, um, and welcome to the Senate Environment Committee. Uh, please introduce yourself formally for the record, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, members. My name is Colonel Rodman Smith. I'm the Director of Enforcement at the Department of Natural Resources. I have like four slides just to get through real quick, and then um, a couple sections I want to highlight for members, and then can stand for questions. But um, as 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 the chair mentioned, uh, the ELS system is really the primary system uh, to issue hunting and angling licenses and other permits to people of Minnesota and its visitors. Um, last year, we did about 2.3 million license transactions for license and permits and over 550,000 motor vehicle title transfers, registration transfers, um, and other things. So the objectives of this new ELS system is not only for people to be able to buy licenses online or from an app, but it's also to update um, some of the work that we do with our deputy registrars and, and, and other license agents. Um, it's really gonna be bringing us into a modern age. It's gonna allow um, for easier registration of harvested animals. So um, today, if you shoot a deer, you not only have to put the paper tag on it and, and, and notch it for the day and all that stuff, but then you take it back to camp or whatever, and then you have to call in and register that animal. Uh, the people using the app, well, it'll be a one-touch, one-button thing um, that they can do in the field. Um, so it, it reduces uh, one step for them. Um, you also should note that not everybody has to go to this online app. There still will be the availability for people, um, especially those that... Um, either aren't, don't have access to that type of technology or choose not to use it, like my father who still uses a flip phone, um, they can still go to a bait store and get a printed out license and a printed out tag and everything else. So um, some of the, the new features, it's gonna be a lot much easier for our uh, uh, 24,000 firearm safety students and their parents to register for firearm safety classes. It's gonna be easier for snowmobile, uh, those that want snowmobile education, and then also those instructors um, to get the materials they need. It's gonna be, uh, make it much more seamless for staff out in the field. For example, my enforcement officers that run across somebody that doesn't have their license with them to be able to take care of things in the field if they have them, but they just don't have it with them. Um, and then also for our, our, our management partners like in Fish and Wildlife when they have a, a little better real-time data when it comes to, for example, deer harvest. And as you can see, it's, it, this is a natural evolution, right? We've had the game and fish law we have right now is probably a culmination of over 100 years of patchwork of putting things together over the years. And as you can see over the time from the 1920s when we had a button uh, for a non-resident fishing license um, to the metal tags of the 70s uh, to the current system we have, uh, which was developed in, in 1999. So it's just part of that natural evolution. So really, uh, Senate File 3905 is what Mr. Chair uh, talked about. 
are a lot of the, just this technical stuff that we need to do, right? Instead of having a sticker, it's going to be a pass, you know? Instead of a tag and tagging a deer, you're going to have to validate. And so those are the, a lot of the technical things um, that we need to take care of in this bill. But I do want uh, members just, to, there's a couple sections that aren't as boring as the rest. Um, so if you want to go to uh, section 20, and I'll just point these out quick. We are adding a new definition in 97A105 of validation. And so um, this is, again, uh, with the, if you choose to use the app, you harvest the deer, the tagging and the registering is all gonna happen at one point. And so we just added a definition for validation. Um, section 21 is kind of new language, but not really. Senator Wiesenberg brought this forward last year. Um, and that's just really about the electronics devices itself. I'm sure if you've been to the airport and you go through TSA, uh, they don't touch your phone if you have your airline ticket on your phone, and there's probably a good reason for that. Um, here we're going to have to handle some phones, and basically it says the officer is immune from liability unless they didn't exercise due diligence um, or due care. And then also it's very clear in there that it doesn't constitute the officer the ability to look at anything else on your phone. If you handle your phone to show a license, they're just going to look at the license. A um, couple the other section would be section 28. And section 28 is some language um, that we're seeking really for the transition. So our plan to transition from our current system to our new system is uh, March of 2025. Why did we pick that? Because that is when the, you need to get a new fishing license. We're out of the hunting seasons. We're out of the vehicle registration seasons. But when we make that cut over from the old system to the new, we're going to need three days to move the data from the old system onto the new system. That's just the way the IT business works. And so there's really going to be a couple day period there where people won't be able to buy a new license. And so this really gives the commissioner that authority to allow people to still continue to fish um, or do what they need to do that time of year. Uh, without totally closing down our outdoors just because we're having a data migration. Um, section 40 is one other that I'd like to just call attention to. So um, this isn't a real big deal, but um, so it talks about shelter licenses. And so previous law said that the shelter needed to be licensed. Um, with the way the new system's gonna work, somebody's gonna um, have their name and address or their name and identification number on that shelter. Um, since if you do it through the app, you won't have any uh, a decal or anything to put in the window. And so we're asking that the shelter owner or whoever's name is on that shelter has that shelter license associated with them so that um, we can find out if that person or if that shelter actually does have a license on it. And then the last two are on the last page, or second to last page, section 50 and 52. Um, so section 50 is about, talks about rulemaking. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of technical stuff in uh, statute that we need to change over. There's also a lot of technical jargon um, to get in the modern day in rule. And this is uh, the, the rule, good cause exemption for rulemaking to get those technical changes done in, in rule. And then finally, section 52, just the effective date. So pretty much everything's effective uh, upon the implementation of the new license system. And with that, I'll stand for question, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for your testimony and for walking us through the bill. Um, yes, members, discussion. And actually, before we go to that, I just want to, is, are there any other testifiers for this bill? Okay, that's all we had signed up. But yes, Senator Wiesenberg, that... Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So if we look at page 23 on section 40, um, it says the person, excuse me, on 23.26 and 23.27, the person transferring the animal must possess documentation. Um, should we define that more to say that it's okay to be like a picture on a phone or something because we're not required to have a license? Just so if there's an officer in the field, there's not, I mean, they know that, but should we work on that word? Colonel? Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator Wiesenberg, that, that, that's a good question. And, and 
the transportation animal is further defined, uh, especially for big game, um, in rule, and um, so that I, that should be covered in rule. So I think we're we're, we're going to be okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Any other discussion or questions? Okay. Um, seeing none, Senator Hurd, do you have any final comment before um, we move your bill? Oh, uh, uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is uh, the Senate File 3905 is an agency bill that needs uh, to improve or modernize uh, for our uh, current situation and moving forward. Um, although I'm the only author on the bill right now, I guarantee that we have bipartisan support. Uh, last year, Senator Wiesenberg and I uh, put in a bill to make sure that uh, we get to this point by 2026, and the agency did step forward and was ahead of our time and, and a year ahead in 2025. Um, and I'm glad this is happening. It is an exciting time. We live in a state that are in the forefront with technology as well as our environmental preservation, our fish and wildlife recreation that is one of our economic engine for our state. And so uh, there's a handful of states now already have the system in place like Arkansas, Michigan, Missouri and Ohio, and I think Illinois as well. So I think we should be in the forefront as this, this will create some conveniency and also efficiency uh, for folks out there, and including myself and legislator as well. And I know if my being paperless, my wallet would be less bulky. <laughs> so thank yeah. you and ask for your support. Thank you, Chair Her. Chair Her, would you like to move that Senate File 3905 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Senate State and Local Government Committee? So moved. Members on Senator Hur's motion, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion prevails. Senate File 3905 is recommended to pass and re referred to the Senate State and Local Government Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair McHugh, for uh, taking over uh, while I'm presenting my bill. Next on the agenda is Senate File 4168, and uh, Senator Mitchell couldn't be here, but Senator McHugh, um, on to the bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, it's my honor here today um, in the light of... Um, Senator Mitchell, not able to, to join us today, is happy to stand in as a co-author to present Senate File 41, uh, 4168, which uh, is, provides for a waste composition studies requirement. And um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Assistant Commissioner uh, Kirk Kudelka and to run, walk us through the bill. Welcome, Mr. Kodeka. Uh, please state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. For the record, my name is Kirk Kodelka. I'm an Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and work on land issues. As noted, the bill is introduced uh, on behalf of the agency for waste characterization studies. I just want to spend a little bit of time to go through why waste characterization studies are important to the solid waste programs and also how the bill would function. Waste characterization Waste characterization studies, or waste sorts, help us understand what materials are generated and thrown away. The type of materials it can measure includes food waste, recyclable bottles, plastic, packaging, and other things that we work uh, into managing. These studies are fundamental for us understanding our waste stream. They help us assess, our, assess how our programs and policies are performing and whether there are opportunities to improve them. These waste composition studies allow us to answer the questions that can help the legislature and local recycling programs make informed decisions on what to prioritize. Some specific examples of questions that a study can help answer are, what is the percentage of particular materials captured by existing recycling programs? For instance, aluminum cans in a discussion about 
uh, deposit program? What is the economic value of recyclables that are ending up in the landfill? And what amounts are there for a business to make a decision on whether or not they should invest in a, a venture that would harvest those materials? And then how much of the materials are we generating and how prominent is it compared to other materials? These waste composition studies also put us in position to better understand the greenhouse gas emissions and environmental impacts associated with the waste we generate. The data that's collected can be fed into models to help us understand what those environmental footprints are for greenhouse gases and as we develop additional models for things such as water usage, toxicity and others, we'll be able to explain what are the various methods for various types of materials that are better environmentally, whether maybe we should be focusing on reuse for something or recycling depending on the materials. However, right now the state has only produced two waste comp studies over the last 25 years for MSW, the normal trash you and I and our, our businesses throw away. The most recent study was done in 2013, so quite dated information, and a lot has changed since then. A lot of programs have been instituted, so what is actually going in our waste is much different than what that study has. So the bill lays out a, a process for this to play out. What MPCA would do every two years is instruct facilities for industrial, construction and demo, and municipal waste, how to conduct and what type of categories they would need to do at their facilities. This would help ensure consistency and ability to combine the individual sorts into a statewide picture of what our waste stream looks like, and also make sure we don't rely just on one facility to dictate what may be happening in another part of the state. MPCA would select 20% of each facility in these categories to do this every two years. What this works out to then is each facility under the bill would only have to do a waste sort once every 10 years. What we're trying to do is be able to spread this out across the various facilities to reduce the potential impact on them. Once completed, those facilities would turn in their results to the MPCA, where MPCA would then aggregate that information and produce what is, would be a statewide composition study for the various waste streams, which would then be used by local programs, the state programs, and others to determine how well our, program, our programs and our investments are doing. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, thank you for the time, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Members, any questions? Senator Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner Gazelka, or Kadelka. Uh, um, I was looking through this, and uh, it, it looks like, you know, it seems like you're stretching these out, but a lot of these, these private companies actually are, are struggling as it is. Did, did you talk to them and ask them, you know, what kind of burden this would put on them, what, uh, what they expected uh, an increased cost and even manpower? which is in short supply right now. Assistant Commissioner. Mr. Chair and committee members, we have been getting some feedback from various entities that would fall under this. Under current law, waste energy facilities and landfills, for instance, Dakota County, are required to do waste sorts. So this would create consistency on those type of facilities across the, the rest of the state. There is a, a cost to do those individual sorts. We do have estimates on those based on um, past compositions waste composition studies and what we've talked to other states. But again, this is spread out over 10 years, so they would only have to pay for it once every 10 years, the costs. Well, th agree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for that answer. But so you, you do have, you, you do know what it would cost a prospective business. So what would be the average cost to these uh, entities? Assistant Commissioner. Mr. Chair and committee members, we expect an individual sort would be uh, 100000 or less every 10 years. So that would be a cost that they would have only occurred once every 10 years. Senator Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, whether it's 10 years or not, that's a chunk of change. 100000 bucks. This is $10,000 a year. Um, wow. Um, I uh, think we should think about that a little bit. Uh, the other concern I have is on page 2, starting at 1-9, it's, uh, it's allowing the commissioner basically to go in and, uh, and take files or, you know, whatever else they, they think they need uh, from these companies. And I'm wondering even the legality of that in this bill. Have you, uh, have you discussed that or is there any concerns around that? Uh, assistant Commissioner. Mr. Chair and committee members, the, the information that's being requested under uh, 2.21, it mirrors what we are doing in other bills where if we're asking for information 
to determine um, compliance with it, the person would have to furnish any information they have that's reasonably attainable. This is language that's been passed in other legislation over the, the past few years. The language under C about access to the property is actually already in current law. All we're doing is moving it over from 115A.5501 so it mirrors that exact language. Both of these are drawn specifically on language already granted by the legislature to perform other functions for the MPCA. Uh, just a comment, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I realize that this has been passed in other bills, but that doesn't uh, relieve my concerns that uh, I don't even know if it's, it's technically illegal to do this. I mean, generally, in the past, before this, uh, um, these last few uh, legislative sessions, uh, you can't go into, pr uh, into property, you can't seize property, you can't ask for different uh, pieces of information unless you can go to a judge and prove that you need it. Uh, now it just seems like the commissioners, once again, are having the authority to bypass not just the legislature in many cases, but now the judicial system. Um, I, uh, I really think this bill should be thought out a lot more and maybe look at some of the issues as well. Thank you. Any further questions? Anybody from the audience? Um, testify in support uh, against this bill. Welcome. Brian, welcome. Uh, Brian Morrison. Morrison. <laughs> welcome to the committee and do state your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, committee members. My name is Brian Martinson. I'm the Environment and Natural Resources Policy Analyst with the Association of Minnesota Counties, and I'm here also on behalf of the Salt Waste Administrators Association. Uh, SWA appreciates the state's interest in this data, but these are not inexpensive studies, and we view this proposal as an unfunded mandate. This cost is also not necessarily scaled to the size of a facility and can be a bigger burden for smaller facilities around the state. We are also interested in understanding better what is the proper number of facilities and how often is it necessary to get representative data on the system and the streams and to understand changes coming into these facilities. In the past, when the state has requested this data, funding was provided. We understand there is limited state funding available for new programs, but local governments are also making difficult budget choices at this time without new expenses being added. We are happy to continue the conversation with the bill author and the MPCA about this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to, to that, that point, if you would stay there, I got a question, a couple questions for you. Um, when, uh, you know, you talked about the scalability, and I understand that, uh, that that could be a burden. But um, as you obviously represent these people and that, that are doing this, have you uh, had many conversations on this, or did this, uh, is this something you saw coming, or is it just kind of when this bill came forward, did it hit you? Uh, the agency did share with us a plan to um, bring this legislation forward. We have been working to gather feedback from our, our membership that operate uh, publicly owned landfills, and um, that is why we're bringing the concern about the, the cost impact of this okay. proposal. Okay. Mr. Chair? Senator Green? Then, uh, if, if you're going to be uh, increasing by this much, and I assume that, that maybe the agency got their $100,000 figure from you, so assuming that's correct, is that going to increase the cost of the, the consumer that brings this in? Mr. Mortensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator. Um, actually, the data on what the expected cost of the studies was given to us by the agency. Um, and I, we haven't done analysis about how those costs would be recouped. Uh, it would be a decision at each uh, local facility how, 
how they determine to raise those revenues, but it would likely result in some need to bring in new revenues to cover the costs. Okay. Just another anything? comment, Mr. Chair. Um, I, was, I was talking to some of my, uh, my landfill guys today, and this is also recycling, I believe, so it's more than just landfills. And uh, if, uh, <clears throat> if this goes through and we continue to increase the prices of, uh, of the, the dumping or the recycling, um, we're already seeing um, people dumping stuff on back roads because they're not paying for it. And, you know, we want recycling. Everybody wants to, to get what we can out, get the recycling done, and they're making efforts. But if people have to pay for this, I don't think they're going to. And I think you need to maybe step back a little and, uh, and move a little slower and see with, you know, as we move, move forward, put some, some policies in place, maybe some that you have, maybe you've put too many already, but see if they work before you keep piling on. And that's kind of what we're doing here. And uh, we have uh, our, our counties that have the public landfills and the recycling centers are getting very concerned that they don't have the money for this. They're coming and asking for grants and bonding for uh, putting in new facilities because the state is shutting down the facilities they've got and there's no place to put the, the material. So I think we're moving kind of fast. I would like to see this uh, slowed down. Thank you. Senator, Mor Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Senator McEwen, for stepping in. I, this is for, for the bill co-author or maybe for Assistant Commissioner Kadalka. Is it, is it true that the last time this information was gathered was in 2012? Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Chair and committee members, that is correct. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. So it, it seems to me that this is probably information that we need to have updated on a regular basis, which it seems to me is the, the intent here. Has, is there evidence that our waste stream has been increasing over that time? Assistant Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, since that time, a number of policies have been put in. For example, a lot of work has been done on organics. So being having a better understanding of what type of food scraps and what type of materials are going into the waste stream would be very helpful to see, one, if the programs we've instituted are successful, and then, two, what is remaining, what type of programs may need to be targeted that way, whether it's grants or policy changes on the local or state level. Any follow-up, Senator no. Morrison? Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you. Okay, any further question? Uh, Senator, Senator McEwen, any uh, closing comment? Uh, uh, thank you, bill. Chair, and thank you, members, and for the discussion and for hearing this bill today. Um, it does strike me that the, there is an urgency to have this information and that there, of course, is a cost. There's always going to be a cost. And so the question is, where does that come from? But this is very important information that we need that hopefully will actually reduce costs going forward if we have it. So um, I ask for your support of the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McEwen. And this bill, Senate File 4140. 4168 will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus environment bill. Thank you. And uh, next is Senator Kupak. Oh, he's here. All right. Welcome to the Environment, Climate, and Legacy Committee. And you have a bill. Okay. And Senator Kupak, make yourself comfortable um, when you're ready. Uh, onto the bill, and it looks like you have uh, two amendments to be made. I do. Uh, one, from my knowledge, is one is a delete all, and the other is amendment to the delete all. Yes. Senator, Senator Hoffman, what? Would you move uh, that uh, the A1 amendment of se to Senate File 3941 be adopted? Mr. Chair, so moved. Okay, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Then here, motion prevail. Okay, thank you. And then the, the A2 amendment, Senator, Senator Morrison, Morrison, would you move uh, that uh, the A2 amendment to the to Senate File 3940 be amend, as amended be adopted. 
So moved, Mr. Chair. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed, nay. Okay, motion prevail. Okay, uh, Senator Kupak to the bill. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, committee. Uh, I'm proud to present this uh, electronics waste recycling bill uh, for you today. Uh, even though over 130 million, 133 million pounds of e-waste are available for recycling in Minnesota each year, according to a pilot study, about 25 percent of about 20 percent of it only gets captured. Uh, so it's time, I think, to take the next step uh, and electronic recycling recycling increased from that 20% mark. At a 100% e-waste recycling rate uh, in Minnesota, the top uh, e-waste values uh, for things like palladium, platinum, copper, tin, copper, nickel, and cobalt, valuable uh, metals and minerals uh, could be extracted out of this waste stream. So the study found that the projected job creation, too, of a 100% e-waste in Minnesota, if we were to be captured, uh, is about 1,738 direct jobs to do this, uh, with a total of 3,345 new jobs uh, in other areas. This bill does two things. It updates the current e-waste recycling that was passed back in 2007 and creates a new fund that comes from a recycling fee when these electronics are purchased. Uh, currently, our counties are coming up short on those funds from recycling this waste. That shortfall uh, then has to be made up either by uh, county taxpayers or in some other fund. That electronic waste also contains toxic substances that, uh, that when recycling stays out of our landfills and also by pulling this out, it also extends the life of those landfills, which is also another savings to the county. So with that, Mr. Chair, I have some testifiers. Okay, welcome. Please introduce your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Maria Jensen with uh, Recycling Electronics for Climate Action. A shortage of critical metals puts our energy transition at risk. Metals which could be extracted from our electronic waste. Minnesota's annual e-waste stream contains $3 billion worth of all the metals we need. In Minnesota, we only collect 20% of our e-waste, and much of the rest ends up in landfills where it contributes to 70% of the heavy metal contamination there. Inaction is costing us more every single year. Waste companies suffer from battery fires on a weekly basis and at a rapidly increasing rate. Whereas small fires cost businesses an average of $2,600, large fires can cost up to $50 million. Please refer to the RRS study provided. In 2018, Blaine, Minnesota lost a $20 million transfer station. And last year, Rice County landfill had a battery fire that burned for almost a week straight. SF3940 will greatly reduce how many batteries end up in our waste stream and thus save Minnesota taxpayers and businesses millions of dollars a year. It is time to replace our program from 2007 that sends most of its funds out of our state, relies heavily on charging Minnesota, Minnesotans per item recycled, and relies on Minnesota tax dollars to subsidize its shortcomings. There are three things needed to fix this collection program. One, an expanded definition. The current program covers TVs and computers. SF3940 will cover the entire e-waste stream. Two, make sure the cost of recycling is covered before the item is purchased. SF3940 will provide free e-waste recycling for all Minnesotans. And three, by directly reimbursing collection sites for the electronics recycled, SF3940 provides an incentive to collect more material and sufficient funds to spend on marketing to raise awareness among residents. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jensen. Uh, next testifier is Mr. Mortensen. Uh, welcome back and inter introduce yourself for the record. And uh, I'd like to call Ms. Uh, Tamara Giller to the testimony to table to since you're next on, on our agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Brian Martinson. I am a policy analyst with the Association of Minnesota Counties and also here on behalf of the Minnesota Sol Waste Administrators Association, or SWA, which is an affiliate of AMC. 
In 2006, Minnesota banned certain electronics from disposal due to hazardous materials that they contained. In 2007, the Minnesota Re Electronics Recycling Act was passed, and electronic manufacturers were to cover the cost of recycling these devices. However, the program is not working, and local governments and residents are picking up most of the tab. Under the current system, manufacturers negotiate a price with recyclers at rates that don't cover the full costs of electronics collected. Recyclers then must make up that cost difference by charging collectors who pass those on to residents, either through fees or by subsidizing the program with tax revenue. The current program does not include coverage for the cost of collection. This results in end-of-life charges that deter proper management and suppress collection rates. Senate File 3940 continues a product stewardship approach for covered electronic devices that remain among the most problematic and difficult to manage. This program will provide access to free electronics recycling, which will increase overall e-waste e recycling, creates a requirement for convenient access to e-waste collection sites, and to expand the program. Covered electronics will go to certified, elect, uh, certified recyclers to ensure best practices are being followed during recycling. The proposal was developed after review of what other, is working in other states and adapted those approaches for Minnesota. This fall, SWA hosted stakeholder meetings to gather feedback from collectors, recyclers, e-waste recycling program managers, mm -hmm and industry representatives. We also spent much of the fall and winter working with RECA to develop a share approach to reach their goal of 100% collection. The language of the DE amendment merges our approaches in order to manage these related materials that have different, from different product categories. SWA continues, um, We'll continue our discussion with stakeholders on the CED program and are willing to consider changes that meet the core needs of this program update. Statewide access to free collection and recycling of covered electronic devices paid for by the product manufacturers. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Uh, next on our list of agenda is Tamara Gillard. I don't know if she's okay. Welcome, and following her will be Tony Salt. Uh, you can make your way to the table as well. And I'll call, and I will call um, the next person uh, to fill the seat so that we can uh, move along um, accordingly. So th welcome, uh, Ms. Gillard. Uh, do state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Senator Kopech. My name is Tamara Gillard. I'm the executive director for Minnesota Tech for Success, formerly Minnesota Computers for Schools. Uh, MTFS is a nonprofit organization. We've been in existence for uh, 27 years. Our mission is to create digital equity for students. We partner with schools, educational organizations to provide technology access, STEM education, uh, and programming and IT workforce development in our underserved communities. MTFS recycles, refurbishes, and repairs donated computer technology, which is placed in schools and nonprofits across the state. Since our founding, we've placed over 110,000 computers in Minnesota, creating digital equity for students across the state by increasing, increasing the access to technology. We also offer opportunities for free certification training and entry-level employment um, and internship opportunities at our organization. I'm in support of Senate File 3940. Minnesota's electronic waste contain, contains metals that are needed for clean energy, and our annual waste stream contains over $3 billion worth of precious metals. By recycling our e-waste, we can create those over 1,700 direct jobs and track for supplying metals for energy transition. It is extremely important that we have the necessary bills in place to save our state's environment. 
Uh, we are NAID, AAA certified, R2 version 3 certified, and a number of ISO certifications. Um, R2 version 3, the motto is test, repair, reuse, and recycle, and reuse is extremely important to that. We take that to heart. Refurbishing donated computers and giving them to students. Reusing technology in such a way helps create digital equity while keeping e-waste out of the landfill. R2 certification requires recyclers like us to assure that toxic material streams are managed safely and responsibly by downstream vendors all the way to final disposition. These certifications are costly and providing a bill like Senate File 3940 makes it, like us uh, makes it doable for community members to be able to bring in their recycling and um, at no cost. And this bill also provides a way for that to be funded. People do not like to pay for the recycling fees. We hear this all the time. And by passing this, we will be able to provide free recycling. And this will increase how much material we can truly divert from the landfills. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Gillard. Uh, next testifier is uh, Mr. Tony Selt. And I'd like to call also Lucy uh, Molani to, to, to the table. Go ahead, um, Mr. South, uh, please state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee and Senator Kopech. I am Tony Selt. I work for Integrated Recycling Technologies, IRT. We are located in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Uh, we operate out of a 238,000 square foot facility. Uh, we are currently um, recycling 40 to 50 million pounds annually of e-waste, and we have the capacity for 253 million pounds of e-waste annually. Um, we are all for uh, this bill to keep the electronics out of the garbage and out of landfills and into the hands of collectors and processors within our state that can handle the electronics responsibly. Uh, we are also R2V3 certified and NAID certified. Uh, we do reuse, refurbishing, uh, but mostly recycling. Thank you very much, Mr. Self, for your testimony. Um, Ms. Uh, Molani, and, uh, I, I saw before that I'd like to call um, Ivana Stock of Clearwater Action to the table. Now go ahead, Ms. Uh, Molani. Thank you, Chair Her, uh, members of the committee, and Senator Kupek for your leadership on this issue. I'm Lucy Milani. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy with Eureka Recycling. We're one of the largest recyclers in Minnesota, and we're a proud union shop with union mechanics and drivers. Electronics placed in the recycling carts are impacting the health and safety of our workers and increasing the cost of doing business, which in turn increases the cost of contracts with local communities. We experience on average 17 fires a year in our material recovery facility or inside one of our recycling trucks. These fires are due to batteries and electronics that have been put in the curbside recycling bin. As we've seen at recycling facilities around the country, these fires can very quickly spread to incredibly flammable plastic and paper. Fires in a truck or what we call a hot load are especially dangerous. When this occurs, our drivers have to immediately find the safest place in the community to dump all of their recycling. This has resulted in injuries, including third degree burns. Additionally, the risk of fires is resulting in a significant increase in insurance costs uh, that is making it tough to stay in business. This past year, it was challenging to even find an insurer. Once we finally found an insurer, there were new restrictions on the insurance, and we had to push back against not having any coverage if a fire is caused by a lithium battery. Other costs include disposal fees, fixing or replacing impacted equipment, the cost of lost recyclables, funding for fire rover equipment, and additional employee training, among other costs. 
The amount of e-waste is only expected to increase, and action on e-waste will result in continued challenges for Minnesota's recycling industry and continued harm to human and environmental health. It's time the state took action to address improper disposal of electronics by passing this bill. We welcome all of you out to Eureka's Murph um, to see our incredible team in action, and I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mulani. Like, I'd like to call um, Mr. Assistant Commissioner Kodelka to the table and Ms. Stark, anytime you're ready. Chair Her and members of the committee, I'm Ivana Stark, State Director of Clean Water Action. On behalf of our 132,000 Minnesota members, I'm here to ask for your support of Senate File 3940. And thank you, Senator Kupak, for bringing this common sense bill forward. This bill creates jobs, generates revenue, and protects waste haulers from truck fires. And while e-waste poses, uh, poses a threat <clears throat> because of the many heavy metals and chemicals it contains, let's just focus on lead. 70% of lead fill, landfill lead pollution is from discarded electronics, and the EPA estimates that nationally 300 million pounds of lead from 500 million computers enter U.S. landfills from obsolete computers every year. As a reminder, Minnesota has 101 landfills and 98 of them are leaching into our groundwater. This means that whatever leaches out of the landfills gets into the water, we drink our water, we get sick. You've heard, heard me say this before. We all know that lead is dangerous. It disrupts the nervous, respiratory, reproductive, and digestive systems. And lead is particularly dangerous on developing brains for children. It impacts how children learn and grow. The return on investment with combating lead exposure is really high. So for example, lead paint hazard controls cost about $17, but it returns $221 to society. A Michigan study estimates that the effects of childhood lead poisoning at about $330 $33 million per year in that state. And as a school board member myself, I can attest to the cost of special education programs for students who need that additional support. Lead costs us in every sector of society. Last session, the legislature passed hundreds of millions of dollars in funding to replace lead service lines, and we need this bill to complement last session's work to further protect our water. This is clearly something our community cares about and something the legislature is willing to take action on, and for that, I thank you. But we're missing an important part of the puzzle with lead, and that's turning off the tap of more of it entering our landfills. This bill is a vital step forward that we must take to protect Minnesota's water, and I urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Stark. I'd like to call to the table um, Ms. Amber Backhouse. Um, Mr. Kadaka, uh, state your name for the record, and you may proceed. Thank you, Chair and Committee members. For the record, my name is Kirk Kadelka. I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. And just want to spend a little bit of time elaborating on how the current e-waste uh, product stewardship program is not working or achieving the results set out by the legislature, uh, many, which are for manufacturers to be responsible for the full cost of the end of life, uh, proper management of their products. Instead, Minnesotans, through their counties or direct payments, are paying for, what, for most of the cost to properly recycle these materials. So we want to share a little bit about the program data that we have to, to really show you how this problem is man, manifesting in two different ways. One, not all the pounds of electronic waste that's recycled in Minnesota are covered by manufacturers. And two, the amount of materials that are covered or um, contracted out by the manufacturers are only covering a portion of the true cost for counties and individuals. On the first part, over, uh, not all recycled pounds are covered by manufacturers and their obligations. Over the last four years, annually on average, 3.4 million pounds of electronic waste that has been recycled has not been covered by manufacturers. This amounts to just over 17% of the total amount of pounds recycled. That means others are having to pull the, pay the full cost of this recycling, whether the counties, local governments, or consumers directly. Second, the cost of recycled pounds are not covered entirely by manufacturers, those that they are contracting to cover. In 2022 and 2018, we looked at data we received from counties, manufacturers, and other states' programs to determine who was paying for the cost of recycling these materials. And with the data that was shared with us by manufacturers and recyclers, it's clear the manufacturers are only covering about a third of the costs. The remainder of the costs are covered by counties and or consumers. And we see this play out, as mentioned earlier, by the counties, whether it's counties 
charging fees when you bring it to a local recycling facility or you bring it to a retail facility that charges a consumer fee. Some counties also elect to cover this through their tax, property tax revenues, so the consumers do not have to, to pay that fee. Ultimately, it is still them paying it through their property taxes. If the e-waste system was operating as intended, counties would not be left with these unpaid pounds of e-waste and consumers would not be paying these recycling fees. These costs should be covered by the manufacturers of the products with a properly functioning program, which is why we believe something needs to be done to fix this problem, such as this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kadeka, Assistant Commissioner. Uh, I'd like to call Ms. Uh, Sarah Syke to the table and Ms. Backhouse, uh, you may proceed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus. I'm with United Strategies, and I'm here on behalf of the National Waste and Recycling Association, Minnesota chapter, and the member companies that provide collection, sorting, recycling, and disposal of residential and commercial waste in Minnesota. The NWRA Minnesota chapter supports the structure of Senate File 3940, which addresses a gap in how to manage problematic materials at their end of life. The, as you've heard, the current electronics recycling system is not capturing enough materials, which end up in garbage and recycling carts, posing a significant safety risk to our haulers and processing facilities. The improper disposal of products containing lithium ion batteries leads to these batteries experiencing degradation because of the loading, compacting, stacking, and crushing, which they weren't made for, and that causes that thermal runaway heat that can result in big fires. The, uh, based on a survey of materials recovery facilities, each has more than 18 fires per year, which is in line with some of the previous testimony you've heard. And again, this has led to skyrocketing insurance rates, which have increased 10 to 50 times due to fires. And that's a completely unsustainable economic scenario for our member companies. With lithium ion batteries expected to increase by sixfold in t by 2030, it's essential we have a system in place like the one proposed in Senate File 3940 that will support the proper collection and handling of these volatile materials. And lastly, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the proponents of the bill for inviting NWRA Minnesota to the table early as this legislation was being contemplated, incorporating our feedback, and developing a product stewardship program that builds on our existing e-waste infrastructure and doesn't give the brand manufacturers control over the logistics of managing it. So we're happy to um, provide the opportunity to prov provide support today to this bill, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Beckers. Um, Ms. Sarah Sick, Hi. please take your name for the record. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Kupek, and members. My name is Sarah Pasik, and I represent CTIA, which is the Wireless Association. Um, first, I want to thank Senator Kupek and the advocates. We've had a lot of conversations and for working with us on um, throughout the bill and then continuing these conversations going forward. The A2 amendment that you adopted changes my testimony a little bit, but I still want to just provide a couple comments. Um, the wireless industry supports sustainability efforts to ensure our business operations and products are environmentally conscious so that we can build resilient communities. Our members, including wireless carriers and device manufacturers, take that responsibility for good being good environmental stewards seriously. Mobile devices have an, an inherent value for recycling purposes. They um, contain a variety of different materials that can be reused to create new mobile devices, electronics, or other products, reducing unnecessary waste and saving energy that would be spent on sourcing new materials. Charities across the country recycle mobile devices as a means to raise funds for various causes, while other nonprofits provide wireless devices to domestic violence survivors, senior citizens, or police and fire departments to use in emergencies. Mobile devices also have inherent value for trade and purposes. Wireless carriers regularly provide discounts for device trade-ins that can considerably reduce the cost of a new device. Additionally, wireless retailers offer similar programs that can help drive down a consumer co consumer's cost of the next device. Um, the one comment I want to make is the 3.2% retail fee on electronics recyclables will still be placed on some of our other products like tablets and other devices, um, which can drive up the cost of those devices by about $30 or more. So, we want to continue working, continue working on building a sustainable future, and again, thank the bill author and um, the advocates for working with us. So thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, one person on, on remote that will, would like to testify. Um, if anyone in the audience that want to speak in support of again, uh, feel free to come to the table after uh, this individual online. Uh, Mr. Walter Alcorn, um, are you online at the moment? I, I am, Chair Herb. Okay. Please uh, state your name for the record and you may testify. Thank you very much. My name is Walter Alcorn. I'm the Vice President of Environmental Affairs at the Consumer Technology Association, and we represent the manufacturers and retailers of uh, at least the covered electronic devices uh, that are targeted in this, uh, in this legislation, at least for that part of the legislation, um, as well as manufacturers and retailers of other products um, uh, that, are, that are also covered in SF 3940. Um, we do have some concerns. I've submitted some written testimony, uh, but I wanna focus on the CED or covered electronic device portion of the measure. Uh, we have been in discussions with the Association of Minnesota Counties. I wanna thank Mr. Martinson for his collaboration and consideration of our concerns. Uh, we do see a path forward for meeting their requirements uh, as he stated in his testimony earlier today. Um, we have submitted uh, and are suggesting uh, that the approach that was used just last year and worked out uh, in the state of Oregon uh, amongst the stakeholders there would be a viable way to meet the counties as well as uh, PCA's uh, requirements. And that is that uh, the costs be covered by manufacturers, that's recycling, transportation, and also collection costs are covered in uh, the Oregon model. So uh, that is uh, an approach that we highly recommend. Um, we do realize that it is going to increase our costs, uh, but in general, if you're, uh, we would request that if we're being asked to pay uh, for the recycling, that uh, we be allowed to set up a system under PCA oversight uh, that could actually uh, allow the system to function efficiently. Uh, and that's what uh, we would be seeking uh, for that portion of the bill. The rest of the bill uh, in, in terms of, I guess now a 2.2% uh, retail administered tax, we're still digesting that. That's probably the most ambitious e-waste proposal I've ever seen. <laughs> and so we're still trying to get our arms around that, uh, but uh, we'll certainly be looking at the amendments um, and the new language and will weigh in uh, and look forward to playing a constructive role as you're looking to update your, your e-waste law. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Alcorn. Any questions from members? Senator Green. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll probably try to make this quick in case other people have questions as well. Um, but, you know, the comments were made that that this was going to be free, and we've heard from the testifiers it's not free. It's going to be added on to the cost of the um, the, the product at the at the at the start of it. So consumers will be paying this, and I understand that's the way it works. But I think we should be clear on that that it's not a free service, and uh, the manufacturers are not going to be paying this. They're going to be passing the cost on. Uh, so just know that. Yeah, but Minnesota already has a solid waste tax. Uh, that uh, raises over $100 million a year. So, uh, Senator Kupek, do you, uh, do you have the numbers of how short we are as to why this is coming forward and what possibly this could raise? You're starting out at $2,500 a year or for the first, the first uh, installment, and after that, it's on a scale. So, do, you have any, do they have any ideas as how much will be coming in? Senator Kupek, I'm sure. Ms. Jensen. Senator right, well, Kupek. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Green. And I'll start, and then uh, I'll let my testifier also probably back up a little of the information. So clearly, where where we're at right now, uh, the money that's coming in is not is not enough to make counties whole. They, they're coming up short. Um, so we need to find, I think, some other mechanism uh, to get that that money there. And I, I don't have the exact breakdown, but maybe my testifier will be able to answer a little bit more on that. I can speak to the fee side of the program. Um, I just wanted to provide some examples on how much this uh, fee will cost consumers compared to what they're paying now when they're 
trying to recycle their devices. For example, a TV, if you bring a TV to be recycled, um, you'll pay between $30 to $125 for that TV. Under this program, they will not pay anything, and the, the TV will be covered by the manufacturer portion, um, manufacturer pr producer responsibility pr portion of this bill. Um, and a microwave, for example, um, they'll be paying around $6 when they purchase the microwave, and then when they want to recycle the microwave, it will be free, whereas today um, they'll pay between $20 and $30 to recycle that microwave. Um, another example is a smoke detector. Under this bill, they'll pay about 92 cents um, when they purchase the device, whereas right now they pay $15 per uh, smoke detector, depending on where they live, um, for recycling. So um, all in all, this program is gonna be a lot more efficient and um, save consumers money. And it's something that is very, very popular. I've done lots of presentations gathering information about what consumers want and, um, or, and Minnesota residents, what, you know, what it is that they want to see in this program. And including the cost of collection into the cost of the item is something, is an idea that's very, very popular um, among residents. Mr. Sure. Sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think you're missing the point, but I'm not gonna belabor it except to say that um, the, the cost of the recycling, if, if the companies are getting charged that much money for the recycling, they're going to pass that on. They have no choice. And so that's how, that's how business works. But the one thing that I did have a real uh, question about was, uh, you know, we've got entities like Amazon. And uh, you could easily, I would, I would think anyway, go on Amazon, order a computer or a laptop, and it could come directly from another country. Uh, how do you track that? How do you go into that manufacturer and say, you know, we want to look at your books and, and see how many you've, you've imported and so that we can charge you on a scale? Uh, Senator Kupak, um, Ms. Jensen. Sure. So uh, currently the uh, e-waste team at the MPCA, and we can uh, refer to uh, Assistant Commissioner Kurt Kadalka on this as well, but they have what they call a cease sales list. Um, so if there's a manufacturer that is selling a covered electronic device online, if they have not re registered, then the MPCA staff reaches out to Amazon or eBay or Shopify, and they tell them that they need to cease the sales from this manufacturer until they have registered. And this has been very successful, in fact, Amazon and eBay has been, have been proactive in the past few years in um, ceasing the sales from unregistered manufacturer without impetus from the MPCA. Thank you for that answer, Ms. Jensen. Sorry, just, just, just to comment, that, that answer actually scares me, uh, that now the government agency, non-elected government agency, uh, will have the power to tell a private business what they can and can't sell. That is not a road we should be going down. Thank you. Any, any further discussion from members? Okay, uh, Senator Hauschow. Thank you, Chair Her, and uh, thanks Senator Kupak for bringing this important bill. Um, I'm excited to be a co-author with you, and I'm also very excited that it's a bipartisan bill. Um, I think that's really important to note because you don't always find that when we're talking about environmental uh, policy. Um, I see this bill as a unicorn, and, and by that I mean I see it really as a win-win. Um, we're addressing both, you know, the, the challenges with recycling that were mentioned by many of the testifiers and the toxins and the fires and the different things that our counties have to deal with and our local governments. But secondly, and I think most importantly, we're addressing the, the critical minerals that we need in order to address the uh, climate crisis that we face. Um, and that's something that I'm very acutely aware of uh, in northern Minnesota. You know, a lot of studies show that about 40% of our critical mineral supply could come from e-waste, 40%. Uh, and that's with a good program that, that these advocates and, and that Senator Kupek has come up with. That's for things like wind turbines, that's for things like solar panels, that's for electric vehicles, that's for battery storage, that's for all of the things that we need in our country in order to address the climate challenges that we face. We have to do this. What, I mean, if we don't do this, we're not gonna have the supply of minerals that we need. Um, and the truth is, China and other countries are beating us when it comes to acquiring the rare earth minerals that are needed 
for addressing these challenges. Um, and that's really why the U.S. Department of Energy, for example, has come up with their critical materials list, which lists many of these rare earth minerals as required for us to supply that green energy future that we need. They're the experts. They know that we need these materials. And one way or another, the U.S. consumers, our government, our energy industry are going to acquire these minerals. They're going to because we have to to address climate change. And so 40% could come from e-waste, but the truth is 60% need to come from somewhere else. In northern Minnesota, we have mines where we can get the copper, nickel, and many of the other rare earth minerals that we need. And I understand that that's controversial, uh, but what I'm saying here is that I want an all of the above approach, because we have to. We have to get the e-waste, we have to address the toxins and what's happening in our e-waste, in our, in our waste sites, but we also have to acquire these materials from our existing technology. So my hope is that we can pass this bill, make sure that Minnesota is moving forward with acquiring the, the minerals and, and the e-waste that we need for addressing this challenge, but that we also look at domestic sources of these minerals right here in northern Minnesota. And that's my goal. I will always champion any way we can to acquire these rare earth minerals, whether it's e-waste, mining, or anything else. So if anybody else has ideas on how we can address this challenge, please come to me, because an all of the above approach is the only way we're gonna get this done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Senator Housechild. Mr. Senator Hoffman. Mr. Chair, thank you. I love Senator Housechild. There's some, the volcanic rock that is laying all over the, your area on the, on the North Shore that can be, melted down into rebar and it's lasts 100 years longer. So we're gonna talk about that, I'm kidding. You know what's amazing about this, Senator Kupik, thank you, I, I, I would like to get on Senate file 3940, but to see a, a bill come together that really kind of sets that framework, you know, it sets an established framework, but, but here's the thing I think we don't see a lot of, and, and Senator Kupik, thank you. you, you got a whole bunch of people that all had an input on there with one desirable outcome, right? And we all don't like bad waste, right? I mean, the outcome was, let's let's fix this. And and I saw it firsthand, you know, uh, Maria Jensen, when I toured EnviroCam in Anoka, I mean, you guys, you and John, and you know, just the, what you're doing there and then the aha moment of, oh, wow, they're all connected, right? The Minnesota Tech for Success, you know, the work that you do is absolutely right here on the Midway if you wanna go do it. Eureka, we should all go to Eureka. You know, how much cardboard, and all of a sudden this big old piece of cardboard got jammed up on the, you know, while we were there, we got to see real work being done, all with one thing in mind, you know, less of, a, less of that footprint on society than trying to do it. So I like this. You set the framework. I mean, this is something to build on. So good work, Senator Kupek, and um, if you got room, what you do, I'd like to get on it. So thank you for your presentation. Good job. Senator Icon. No, you can have it, Senator Hoffman. That's okay. I, I do think it's a good goal, and I agree with Senator Hochschild's point that the all of the above approach is important. But like Senator Green, I do share his concerns. I also have a concern about, you know, at the point we're at now, we're already squeezing Minnesotans in a lot of ways. Inflation is hitting people, and this is just another tax on consumers, and they're going to get hit at point of sale, and they're going to get hit in increased prices for manufacturers. So that, that is a concern. I mean, if you're buying a $1,000 computer, maybe you can afford the extra 20 bucks or whatever, but it's, it's still getting squeezed in a lot of ways. Um, I do also appreciate that, that Grant started to go down the path of what we have in Minnesota for critical minerals. The statement here says, a pending shortage of critical minerals. It's not a pending shortage. The shortage is here now, and there's a reason that China is already kicking our butt in rare earth mineral extraction and getting those minerals. It's because they don't have any real environmental regulations. They just dig. In fact, some of these critical minerals, the 60% we got to dig out of the ground, are literally coming from children in third world countries that are digging these minerals out. And that's not fair at all to those kids or to the green energy movement if we really want to do this the right way. And so, you know, I always appreciated the way Senator Tomasoni always talked about it. And, you know, we have these minerals here. If we could just get out of our own way and quit fighting this, we have some of those 60% of the minerals sitting in the ground just outside of my district in Senator Wiesenberg's district, in Senator Hostile's district, in Senator Farnsworth's district. We have one of the most highly, heavily regulated, you know, kind of 
situations in the entire world where we can do this well. We have the people that can do this well. I trust the union members that dig these materials out of the ground that have been doing it for the last nearly 150 years. So if we can just get it out of our way and quit fighting these, I think we can have that all of the above approach that Senator Hostchild is talking about and is so important. If we really are going to have the green economy you guys are talking about, I'm really hopeful that we can find a way to also move forward on getting our critical minerals that are below our feet in Minnesota because not only does that help your green economy, it's going to help all of our school districts, all of our municipalities, all of our counties, and our state as a whole in just that tax revenue. So. I think we've got opportunities here, and I'm hoping that, that we can have your support to move forward on those as well. I know I've got Senator Hostchild's support on that, and I do appreciate him continuing to fight, picking up the torch and fighting for mining with us in northeastern Minnesota, and it's something we can continue to do. So I just wanted to highlight that as well, and I always appreciated the way Senator Tomaso needed it, so I can't miss the opportunity to also do it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Icorn and um, Senator Hostchild, Senator Hoffman also highlight the subject of mining, and we will reserve a future t day, future time for that uh, broader discussion on it. But back to the bill. Uh, oh. oh, okay, Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know I'm hard to see. Um, <laughs> um, no, I, I actually went and I, I toured the Envirochem uh, facility, and I appreciate what's going on. You know, we, we can get some of these um, things out of there. And I, I did tell them there I don't agree with the bill until I read it. Now we have a delete all, so I have to read the bill again. Um, so I have to see what's in here. Um, but then like Justin said too, you know, we do have some of these minerals here and we have to work on getting them out of the ground. And I know they also support mining. So it's, you know, we'll get it from there, but we need to get some of these minerals out of the ground in, in the state here too. So I look through the bill, there's, there's tweaks I'm sure I need to see, but um, yeah, everyone else already said what they think and I, I need to read the bill again. So thank you. Sir Kupak, any uh, concluding remarks? Sure. On, Thank you. Thanks, committee, for this discussion. Um, and, and I always think back, uh, I can remember my first instance of recycling in my life. Uh, my grandfather's neighbor brought me over a car battery and told me that if I took it to this place, they'd give me five bucks for this car battery. I think he was just looking to not lug the car battery down to the place. But I got five bucks, and I thought as a kid, I was like, wow, they're going to take that battery and, and reuse that and take what's there and make another battery out of it. And I thought, that's pretty cool. Plus, I liked the fact that I had some money for baseball cards, so that was very good. Um, but uh, there is, all of these things have some kind of cost, and there, there's an environmental cost to all these products, and um, there's a cost that we're, you know, we're getting charged on the back end of this, that we're paying to, to take things to recycling. And that is certainly not an encouraging thing. And as Senator Green mentioned in the previous bill, people are ditching TVs on the side of the road because they don't want to pay the bucks to do that. So it's either you're going to pay it first or you're going to pay it later. But somewhere we're going to pay the cost uh, of getting this through. And right now the system we have, our counties, our local governments, they are not being made whole uh, by the system we have. And, and so we need to kind of come up with that. I will also uh, remind you on any refurbished item, none of these fees apply to that. So there are some places, there's some great refurbishing places going on in the state of Minnesota where they're taking these old things and making them new and even come with warranties. Uh, and they're a really good low cost item, uh, particularly for people who are a little, a little strapped on the cash on that side. So that's always good too. So I thank you for your support and the discussion on this and uh, look forward to, to working and, and tweaking it any way we can to make it a little better. Okay. Well, thank you, Senator Kupak. And we'll move along uh, with Senator Fowle. Senator Houchow, would you move, move that Senator Fowle 3940 as amended be recommended to pass and is referred to the Senate Commerce Committee? I will excitedly do so, Mr. All right. Chair. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? All right, motion prevail. Congratulations, Senator Kupak. Well, that's concluding our agenda for today. Do you have any announcements? Okay, and agenda for Thursday is already post posted online. You can go check on there. Uh, we'll appreciate all members for your attendance and look forward for, you know, all, all members to be present on this Thursday as well. So, motion.